Welcome to the Rare Books Department at the J. Willard Marriott Library, University of Utah. The Rare Books Department is one of five departments within the Special Collections Division. Other departments include manuscripts, photo archives, audiovisual, and print and journal. Special Collections materials are held on the fourth floor of the Marriott Library and can be accessed by request in the Special Collections Reading and Reference Room. The Rare Books Department holds more than 80,000 items in the collection, including books, maps, ephemera, and realia documenting the record of human communication, from Sumerian clay tablets to 21st century artist books. By actively collecting and digitizing material of historic and aesthetic importance, the Rare Books Department preserves a heritage of thought, artistic endeavor, and innovation that continue to inspire the human spirit today. The philosophy behind the Rare Books Department has long emphasized the importance of the book as a physical object. Some of the most meaningful interactions with our collections occur in the classroom, where students are able to hold history in their hands. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in the classroom at this time, but what I can do is share some digital resources that should inspire you, regardless of what you're studying. First, I invite you to subscribe to Open Book, the Marriott Library's official rare books blog. Open Book is a great way to explore the breadth and depth of the rare books collection. About once a week, we feature a book from our collection and give you a little bit of information about its history. The choices might seem random, but there is a method to the madness. We promise. By exploring Open Book, you'll get to see the vast networks that connect languages, cultures, and periods of history. Plus, you'll be able to impress your friends, family, and even professors with the tidbits of knowledge you'll gain from each post. To subscribe to the blog, enter your email and hit subscribe. To search our archives, click on View All Rare Books Posts. Let's see what comes up when we search for clay tablets. Hmm, this looks interesting. It might come as a surprise to you, but we do in fact have items in the collection that are more than 2,000 years old. Now that's what I call primary sources. The Epic of Gilgamesh was first recorded on clay tablets such as these. Gilgamesh, part man, part god, was a historical king who reigned circa 2700 BC. He was the fifth in line in the founding Sumerian dynasty of Ur, centered around the ancient city of Uruk, known in the Hebrew Bible as Erech. The historical Gilgamesh also built one of the first temples in the holy city of Nippur, which is where these two clay tablets are from. But the inscribed text you see here is not the story of Gilgamesh. It is a palace dedication to King Sin Kashid of Ur, made during the Old Babylonian period sometime between 1900 and 1700 BC. Palace dedications could be made on clay cones or clay tablets such as these. They were intended for the foundation deposits and enclosed within the walls of the royal palace in great numbers, which is why we're so lucky to have a set of our own. In addition to ancient clay tablets, there are so many more interesting posts to browse in the open book archives. But once you're done exploring the Rare Books blog, head over to the digital exhibitions page on our website. Our digital exhibitions are compiled from past exhibitions that were physically displayed in a special collections gallery on the fourth floor. We're currently working on updating our digital exhibitions webpage, so be sure to check back periodically for more. The curation of each exhibition is centered around a specific topic or theme. Let's see what this exhibition has to offer. La Parola Scritta celebrates Italian contributions to printing, poetry, theater, music, geography, mathematics, botany, astronomy, anatomy, law, typography, dance, travel, and so much more. As you browse through the exhibition, you'll find images of books from the collection, along with a bit of information about each book. Here's a familiar name. It's Virgil. Virgil was a Roman poet whose works were an essential component in the teaching of Latin throughout the Middle Ages. And this is a facsimile of the earliest known Roman manuscript to survive from antiquity. 
The Vatican Virgil was produced in 400 AD, and today only 75 of the original 430 folios still exist. The surviving manuscript contains fragments of the Georgics and the Aeneid. The manuscript is written in single columns of the elegant formal script Roman Rustic Capitals, which is characteristic of other surviving manuscripts from Virgil at the time. If you look closely, you'll see that, like most manuscripts of its time, there is no word separation within the text. The illustrations are done in a Roman style similar to wall paintings found at Pompeii. Throughout the manuscript, small miniature paintings are interspersed within the verses, while larger full-page compositions can also be found. The lavishness of the illustrations points to the continued importance of Virgil's text throughout this era, and the revival of Roman literature in the late empire. Yes, even in the digital world, we are still talking about works from the likes of Virgil, Homer, Hesiod, and Ovid. Why? Because their stories play a major role in our understanding of the human experience. Their stories continue to be retold, reimagined, and reinterpreted in such ways that sometimes they're unrecognizable. But they're there, and not just in classical studies, but in popular culture as well. More importantly, they're right here in the Rare Books collection, ready to be used for research and reference. These are just a few of the examples that I could pull out from the Rare Books vault. And here's another, Ovid. Although Ovid lived in the first century AD, his works were passed on well beyond the manuscript era, where books were still being made by hand. During the Renaissance, there was a renewed emphasis on Greco-Roman philosophy, and with it, printed editions of centuries-old literature were being produced. Among those was, of course, Ovid. The University of Cambridge was granted printer's privileges through a royal letters patent by Henry VIII in 1534. It did not actually begin printing, however, until almost 50 years later, after the appointment of Thomas Thomas as university printer. Thomas, a fellow in King's College and notable scholar, printed at least 20 titles for the press before his death in 1588, at the age of 35. The University of Cambridge Press is the world's oldest continually running press and publisher. Its first book was printed in 1584, making this 1584 edition of Ovid one of its first publications. If the literature was important enough, it would be translated into the vernacular for everyday readers, and not just scholars of Greek or Latin. You might have already guessed, but Virgil was, still is, very, very important. This edition of Virgil's works was translated into the English first by John Dryden in 1697, and it was met with high praise. Alexander Pope called Dryden's translation the most noble and spirited translation I know of in any language. The book was produced by subscription, a method of publishing by which the subscriber's patronage enabled the production of particularly lavish books. Initially, there were 101 subscribers, and for five guineas they could each have a full-page illustration in their copy with their names and coat of arms. A second subscription list went out after Dryden had completed half the translation. These subscribers paid two guineas for their copy, which did not include plates dedicated to them. 250 copies were added to this list. Correspondence between Dryden and his printer, Jacob Tonson, reveals several arguments during the publication process. One such quarrel evolved over Tonson's desire to dedicate the book to William III and Dryden's refusal to do so. In response, Tonson made sure that the engravings were adapted so that Aeneas sported a hooked nose, much like the king's. Ancient Greco-Roman myths were preserved in a variety of artistic forms, such as wall mosaics, vase paintings, and sculptures, to name a few. But printed books often lacked the visual qualities which shaped these stories so many years ago. By the end of the 19th century, however, there was a shift in storytelling, inspired by the medieval illuminated manuscripts of the past. In addition to bookmaking, the international arts and crafts movement influenced the style of design in architecture, illustration, photography, painting, and the decorative arts. William Morris was a major player in this movement, and in 1891, he founded the Kelmscott Press in order to print and publish 
limited edition illuminated style books, a cause to which he devoted the rest of his life. Printed as a series of 24 tales, the earthly paradise was one of Morris's last endeavors. This epic poem retells various myths and legends from both Greece and Scandinavia. The story is framed with a group of medieval wanderers searching for a land of everlasting life. They come upon a surviving colony of Greeks who still worship the ancient gods. Here the wanderers live out the rest of their lives. Twice each month they participate in a feast at which a tale is told by one of the city elders and one of the wanderers. The former tells tales on classical subjects, and the latter draws from the Norse and other medieval sources. Thus, of the 24 stories, 12 are in Greek, in classical, and 12 are medieval, or romantic. Morris himself oversaw the completion of the first two volumes, while the remaining six were printed by the trustees of his estate after his death. All of Morris's subsequent books were published as by the author of The Earthly Paradise. William Morris and the Kelmscott Press paved the way for other independent presses to emphasize the book as an art object. In turn, Ovid's stories were once again reimagined, but this time accompanied by beautiful images in the Art Nouveau style. The love books of Ovid are translations of Ovid's more erotic works, including The Loves, Women's Facial Cosmetics, The Art of Love, and The Cure for Love. The Art of Love is written in three books, set out to teach the arts of seduction and loving. The first two books address men, while the third switches its attention to women. Because it celebrates extramarital sex, it is believed that this work is one of the reasons that Ovid was banished by Emperor Augustus, who was trying to promote a more austere morality. Ovid himself attributes his exile to Carmen et Error, a poem and a mistake. But because of his discretion in discussing the causes, there's ongoing speculation about what really happened. The retelling of ancient myths doesn't just end with fine press books, but continues well into the 20th and 21st century with the evolution of artist books. Artist books are books that make us question how we read by drawing attention to every aspect of their structure, form, and content as a way to make meaning. In the case of this book, the story is told through a manipulated structure that makes the reader interact with the book in a very tactile way. The text is a condensed version of Ovid's fable about Bacchus and Philemon, an old married couple who welcomed the disguised god Zeus and Hermes into their home. Their hospitality is an example of Zinnia, the ritualized guest friendship which the ancient Greeks highly valued. Lois Morrison's Bacchus and Philemon is printed on drawing paper. Illustrations are done with watercolor and ink. It was printed in edition of 25 copies, signed and number, and our rare books copy is labeled number eight. If you liked this virtual lecture, be sure to visit the virtual lecture series on our website. Here you can find even more digital resources for reference and research. Here you can learn what a book is exactly and what makes a book rare. You can also gain insight to the vast networks of the book's history and explore how early manuscripts influenced the design of the book for years to come. Dive deeper into politics, science, and literature, and celebrate the Spanish language with an introduction to Jaconic's artist books. And just when you think you've had enough, learn how to transform your creative writing to make your very own artist book. If you have any questions about the books in this presentation or about any of the books in our collection, feel free to send us an email or check us out on our website, lib.utah.edu forward slash collections forward slash rare books.